What does your Chapter 7 trustee really think about your Chapter 7 filing? I'm Jonathan Ginsberg and I'm an Atlanta area personal bankruptcy attorney. You know, when you file bank bankruptcy Chapter 7, it's very unlikely you're ever going to see a bankruptcy judge. Instead, most of your interaction with court personnel is going to be with a Chapter 7 trustee who will be assigned to your case. Now, the trustee is a representative of the court, technically part of the United States Trustee's Office, which is in part, in turn, part of the Department of Justice. That's why, by the way, bankruptcy crimes are prosecuted by the United States Attorney. It's part of the federal government. And the trustee basically has two jobs. Chapter 7 trustee has two jobs. One is to identify assets by looking at your schedules and conducting uh, a hearing called the meeting of creditors hearing that could be liquidated to pay the claims of creditors. The second thing is to review your schedules to see if there's any potential problems, any undisclosed income or hidden assets that they can use to liquidate. So what is a Chapter 7 trustee thinking when he or she gets assigned to your case? So first, to understand this, you need to know how Chapter 7 trustees are paid. And basically, trustees are assigned a block of cases. Trustees in Chapter 7, at least in the Atlanta district, are not full-time employees of the court. They're private attorneys who apply for it and are approved to be on the Chapter 7 panel. So a Chapter 7 trustee may have a calendar that starts at 9 o'clock in the morning and goes through noon. And during that calendar, the trustee may see 40 or 50 cases. Uh, and the trustee may have one or two calendars a month or five or six calendars a month. It just depends on uh, how busy the, 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 the filings are and how busy the trustee is. And so basically what the Chapter 7 trustee is going to do is have somebody in his or her office is going to look through the files and make an initial determination. Is is this an asset case or a no asset case? And obviously uh, an asset case, not obviously, but an asset case is one where there could be assets to liquidate. A no asset case is one where there are no assets to liquidate. So for example, if somebody files Chapter 7, they own no property, all they have is thirty dollars or $40,000 in credit card debt that they want to discharge in the Chapter 7, they don't have anything other than household goods which are considered exempt property, the trustee is going to mark that or the assistant's going to mark that as a no asset case. If the person comes in, they've got real estate, three or four parcels of real estate, they've got a painting, an expensive vehicle, the trustee may, may mark that initially as a possible asset case. Well, if it's a no asset case, the tr and which, by the way, that's about 90-95% of these cases are no asset cases, the trustee gets paid right now $60. And that money, by the way, comes from the filing fee. So if, if your case is one where you don't pay the filing fee because of it being indigent, uh, the trustee won't get paid anything. But most of the time, they're going to get paid $60 a case, which again, for attorneys doing Chapter 7 work, uh, that's probably not a money-making situation because they've got to have staff and process a lot of paper. But what they're looking for are those small percentage of cases that are considered to be asset cases. And basically, if the trustee finds an asset case that he or she can liquidate, they can liquidate assets. The trustee is going to get a percentage of the asset that's liquidated, plus the trustee can hire his or her own law firm to represent the office of the trustee and bill out at the normal rate. Um, so I'll give you an example of a situation I had recently where uh, I filed a case as a Chapter 7. We ended up converting it to a Chapter 13, and the trustee, Chapter 7 trustee, filed a proof of claim for his time. And the trustee's involvement was about maybe three weeks in this case, maybe three or four weeks, and not a ton of time. But basically, this trustee is billing, and I think it was $560 an hour um, as the attorney, and the trustee gets paid at, at a slightly lower rate. But the bottom line is the trustee managed to run up a bill of over $6,500 for just a, a few weeks of work. And, and like I said, it's very, very little uh, amount of work done. Reviewed a case, contacted a real estate agent, that sort of thing. But when you're billing at $500 an hour, it doesn't take a long time for that bill to get really, really high. So um, now whether you think this makes a lot of sense, and I personally kind of have an issue with a trustee being able, being able to hire his or her own law firm to represent the trustee and then to bill whatever they want to bill. Um, but generally speaking, that's the way it's done. So I'm not going to, uh, whether you agree or 
disagree. That's the way it is right now. So obviously in a case that's an asset case, the trustee has an incentive to, again, declare it as an asset case and to start investigating to see whether there are assets to liquidate. And the problem you face as the debtor is if the trustee says, yes, there is an asset here, liquidate, and the trustee then starts billing the file, obviously uh, the incentive for everybody is to liquidate an asset so the trustee can uh, pay his bill or to squeeze you to agree to settle uh, that there's in fact some non-exempt equity so the trustee can get paid. In many cases the trustee gets paid more than the creditors and again whether you agree or disagree that's the system we've got. So again the typical trustee in a no asset case is going to make $60 a case but you know if, if it's an asset case it could be several thousand dollars. Now, what are the things that are, are going to trigger a trustee to declare a case as an asset case? Well, one thing would be uh, home value. And what the trustees are going to do is when you schedule your property, whatever you schedule it for, they're going to look at Zillow and some of the other online tools to see what they say about the value. Or they may send out an agent that they work with to look at your house. And generally, my experience has been if you have a house um, in the $250,000 range or more, that's going to attract some scrutiny. Scrutiny. If you have a business where there are is an inventory or uh, ongoing receipts or goodwill, the trustee is going to look at that and say, you know, I think I can liquidate that. Um, if you schedule collectibles like artwork or even firearms, that could trigger a trustee to um, to take a look. If you got a big tax refund last year, that's going to signal to the trustee you may be over withholding. And what I mean by that is if you declare, um, if, you, if you don't have any exemptions scheduled and you overpay the IRS and you expect to get back five or six or ten thousand dollars in refund, that's kind of like a savings plan. And the trustee is going to say, I think you're uh, not properly scheduling your exemptions for your taxes. That asset, that ten thousand dollar tax refund, I'm going to grab it. Um, now, we'll tell you that some trustees are going to look at, are going to ask for uh, your bank statements to see what you're spending money on. So I've had cases where a client has moved money from one account to the other. If there's any sort of transfer of money, that's going to trigger a trustee to think maybe there is going to be an asset situation here. So the takeaway here is um, if you have any sort of property, um, you're possibly at risk for a trustee to say that there is an asset case there. If you have no property, you have no uh, real property or, or personal property of any, any value, probably going to be a no asset case. But if you have real estate or if you have interest in real estate or if you have collection expensive things, uh, that could trigger that. Um, I think I would also tell you to look at your bank statements and if you see a transfer, um, a large transfer, five or six thousand dollars you're transferring out, that's going to attract attention. And again, there may be a reasonable explanation, innocent explanation, but you need to know. Um, and that would be something you want to talk to your attorney about before you file. If you got a big refund last year, that's something to, to be aware of. If you have, I, w I would tell you if you have any assets in your house. Take an inventory of your personal assets. Do you have anything that could be sold for any kind of value? And it um, used to be a big screen TV was the thing, but of course now you can buy big screen TVs for two or three hundred dollars. Uh, not as big of a deal, but if you have some fancy stereo setup or a big, a brand new um, high end big screen TV, that could be, a, be an issue. Um, I would ask you have you transferred any assets to anybody? The classic is somebody has a vehicle that's paid for, they want to give it to their brother brother or sister to protect it in bankruptcy and they transfer it. Well, trustees can look at the transfer records. They can tra look at real estate re transfer records, car title records. You're not going to sneak one through. So if you've transferred anything, you want to talk uh, to your, your lawyer about that. Um, and again, the last thing you want to be doing is liquidating uh, or having to liquidate assets because, uh, again, you're going to have to pay your lawyer to, to litigate this type of thing. Um, and if you have to liquidate things that are otherwise exempt, that's that's a pretty painful thing to do. So the point is, is that you're not going to sneak anything by, nor should you. You want to be straight and honest uh, with the trustee, with the bankruptcy court when you file bankruptcy. But be aware, if you have any kind of assets and the trustee sees your case as an asset case, that is a potential problem 
And again, what the solution would be is you're going to either have to buy the trustee out of his interest in your property, which could be, again, five, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars and payable over a year, but it's still a bunch of money, or you may have to convert it to a Chapter 13 and then pay the trustee his administrative claim in your Chapter 13 case. Realize also about Chapter 7, you can't just dismiss a case if things are not going well. You have to get permission of the court. You, you can convert it to a 13, but once you follow Chapter 7, you sort of bought into the whole Chapter 7 process. So before you file, that's when that's the time to identify potential problems. And if you talk to an attorney and they say, ah, don't worry about it, not going to be a problem, don't believe that. You want to be very, very careful. Again, if you have any kind of assets, and I always tell my clients, you know, whatever your property value is, you know, what you think it is, you know, you want to have from three or four different sources. You look at Zillow and the online tools, you have somebody drive by, you look at a recent appraisal, you just look around the neighborhood, what what property is selling for because what I find is that trustees are going to look for an agent who's going to come on in on the high side of what the value of the property is and the next thing you know that house that you thought is worth 225 the trustee is saying no I think it's worth 275 and there's 40 or 50 thousand dollars of equity that I want to uh, liquidate and you need to pay me and again you run into the problem of paying the trustee or litigating it and it's going to be out-of-pocket money either way so be really careful and just be alert to the fact that trustees in Chapter 7 are looking for asset cases. Um, hope this gave you some information to think about. Any questions, please reach out to me. I'm at 770-393-4985. Again, Jonathan Ginsburg here, uh, Atlanta Area Bankruptcy Attorney, wishing you the best. Thanks a lot. Hi, this is Jonathan, and I hope you found this video helpful. I'd like to invite you to download my free Debt Destroyer Survival Kit right now. I've packed my survival kit with answers to the questions I've heard from clients for over 25 years here in the Atlanta area. Inside the survival kit you'll find clear, easy to understand answers to critical topics about how to solve debt problems once and for all, including how do I protect my stuff, my house, car and personal property, if I file for bankruptcy? Are there any legitimate alternatives to bankruptcy? Will I ever get credit again and if so, when? What mistakes must I avoid to get the most benefit out of bankruptcy? You can claim your copy right now by visiting my Atlanta-Bankruptcy.com website. And you are always welcome to use the email form on my website to ask me anything about debt and personal bankruptcy in Atlanta. www.Atlanta-Bankruptcy.com And as always, I wish you the best.